You're listening to The Pivot, brought to you by Globally News, where we discuss the leaders, states, networks, ideologies and technologies that are reshaping the world order. Visit our website at globally.news. That's globe, L-Y, dot news. Hi, everyone. Welcome to The Pivot. My name is Arif Rafiq, and I'm your host. Malaysian Prime Minister Anwar Ibrahim has been a fixture of his country's politics for five decades. After a long political journey, from outsider to insider to dissident to something in between, he finally assumed the office of Prime Minister in November 2022. It's a story that's seen many twists and turns, and along with his changes of fortune, there's been a marked evolution in Anwar's political ideology. A prominent Islamist student activist, Anwar was cultivated by longtime Prime Minister Mahathir Mohamad as his heir apparent, only to be victimized and imprisoned by him later. As a dissident, Anwar became an outspoken Muslim Democrat, both at home and on the global stage. And today, his politics, in the view of some, can be described as post-Islamist. The former Malay nationalist now leads a multi-ethnic coalition in a country that's long faced divisions between its Malay majority and Chinese and Indian minorities. Anwar Ibrahim's fascinating political journey is not just his story alone. It's also that of Malaysia. And to help us tell the story of Anwar Ibrahim, we're joined by Meredith Weiss, a professor of political science at the University of Albany and a longtime observer of the politics of Southeast Asia. Meredith, thanks for joining us. Thanks. Pleasure to be here. So uh, Anwar Ibrahim is born in, in 1947 in a Malaysia that's not yet free. And at the moment, it was a, a British colony. It would later become a protectorate before attaining full independence in 1956. I want to turn the clock back to a year before his birth. Uh, in 1946, the United Malays National Organization, or UMNO, is founded. And it's an organization that Anwar's father and Anwar himself would, would later join. So I'd like you to help our listeners understand the basis, the reason why this organization was founded and what it represents in terms of Malaysia's perennial divides. Sure. So I'm now formed in 1946. Independence actually was 1957. Um, and it formed of an association, a, a set of associations at the state level for Malays. So building on colonial precedent, Malaysian politics has come to be organized substantially in along ethnic lines. So um, no formed for ethnic Malays around the same time, just a little bit afterwards, you had the Malaysian Chinese Association and then the Malaysian Indian Congress. And as the name Congress suggests, it was indeed influenced by uh, politicians from India who came to Malaysia um, and ties between India and Malaysia. But each of these parties was seen to represent the communal or, or racial interests of their community. They formed what has loosely been called a consociational government. And I say it's loose because the people who, the political scientists who developed the idea of consociationalism have very strict terms of what it should represent. And Malaysia has never fit perfectly. But essentially, it's a form of government in which individuals are in mutually exclusive, collectively exhaustive pillars. So generally in ethnic lines of, in this case, Malays, Chinese, and Indians. There were others, usually called others, uh, so those who were of mixed um, ethnic heritage or Euro Europeans or Eurasians and Malaysia and so forth. But really this this mix, which formed the National Front or Barisan Nacional, which was initially organized as the Alliance or Perikatan, that was designed uh, to represent interests that were presumed structured along ethnic lines. So when... Anwar's parents and others formed UMNO in 1946. It was with the idea of independence on the horizon. As the British were starting to talk about different forms of basically constitutional arrangements for a new Malaysia, including especially the question of citizenship. So largely due to British colonial policies and economic policies, the composition at the composition of Malaysia had changed over especially the earlier part of the 20th century with large numbers of Chinese brought in in particular to work in tin mines and plantations, large number of Indians also who came, British colonial flows, also mostly for, for plantation labor um, and other sort of mass pursuits such as that, but then also more among the Indian community 
also as clerks and other professionals in the cities. So Malays who were considered indigenous to Malaysia, to Malaysia, along with a small number of various, um, you know, loosely called tribal groups, Orang Asli and Orang Asal, saw themselves as having a legitimate right to the land of Malaysia, Tanah Melayu, the Malay lands, and formed this party really to advocate for their interests when it seemed as though the arrangements the British might force into place might diminish the power of the sultans, who are the traditional leaders of Malay states, and grant liberal citizenship citizenship rights to non-Malays, especially Chinese. And so it was really formed with that premise. Right. And and so, you know, this is something we see throughout the British Empire as the British indicate that they're going to leave in in the wake of the, the Second World War. And a lot of different communities, whether it's in British India or elsewhere, there are these anxieties uh, about the, the subsequent political framework. And so these organizations emerge and, and representing different communities. And UMNO is uh, one of them in terms of uh, what would become Malaysia, right? And, uh, and so, and, and so this, this question of ethnicity or race is one that would bedevil Malaysia from its uh, very early days. And so you talked about this divide between communities that are seen as indigenous ethnic Malays and some, I guess you can call them indigenous communities or maybe a better phrase for that. And then these migrants who had come from uh, China and, and southern India who were part of this British empire in terms of the movement of peoples for labor. And then as concentrated groups of people, they took on political forms and the British really kind of instituted a, a sense of order in terms of what purposes these communities served in terms of the political economy of wherever they 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 ruled and wow. uh and and so you know this is a question of who is malaysia for is is kind of a perennial question that uh, would bedevil malaysia and it even led to the separation of, of Singapore from the Union in, in 1965. And there's this video of Lee Kuan Yew, the, the founder of Singapore, in which he's tearfully mourning uh, this, this separation from Malaysia. Uh, so th- th- this question of the economic and political power of the May- Malay majority is one uh, is, is a really key issue that remains pretty important for Malaysia to today. But religion is also a big factor, right? And, and it's linked to... Yes. Malay ethnic nationalism, and there's kind of more overt uh, Islamic uh, element to Malaysian politics, but there's also one that is more, a bit more uh, identity-based and uh, loosely tied to what it means to be Malay. And when Anwar Ibrahim is coming of age in the 1970s, in in this broader context, in a global sense, there is a, a global Islamic political revivalism in the form of Islamist politics that we see in Egypt, uh, many other Arab countries and in South Asia. And there's an attempt to Islamize um, the, the social sciences and, and academic thought. Now, Anwar is very much a part of that, right? And so I, I'd like you to talk to us about Anwar's political origins, the, the Anwar 1.0, and, and what that says about the moment in which he emerges as a political force in Malaysia. Sure. So Anwar really, in many ways, represents a very particular formulation of the ethnic divide in Malaysia, which is to say, and you alluded to this just now, that there is, there's both a political linked with an identity dimension and an economic dimension. The British kept most Malays rural. I mean, that's where they started off. And there, there was not much of an attempt to change that under British colonial rule. So it's been widely called the divide in rural policy. Whereas he had, um, cities that were more heavily non-Malay, Chinese and Indian, as well as, again, the plantation agriculture and mining and so forth. Um, and part of the key impetus for UMNO and the key pressure that the coalition, the initially the alliance later the Barisan Nacional faced as it started to govern was how to empower the Malay community, especially after these racial riots in 1969 and, and some earlier ones before that, and how to create a Malay middle class, how to distribute the resources, the opportunities, the wealth of the country more justly. There were already some affirmative action policies. Those expanded. Part of that question was intrinsically tied to issues of language and religion. And as a student leader already in the late 1960s, so before the main wave of Islamic resurgence in Malaysia, Amar was part of the, the force that kicked that off 
by raising these questions of Malay identity. The Constitution of Malaysia defines only one ethnicity, and that is, not surprisingly, Malay ethnicity. In granting both a special status or a special position to the Malays in Malaysia, it, it explains who it is enjoys that status. It is people who speak Malay habitually, practice Malay customs habitually, and are Muslim. Malays are not allowed to change their religion from Islam, um, though others within Malaysia may practice whatever religion they choose. And so, especially over time, as thanks in part, no small part, to Anwar's own aggressive efforts at the head of a student union for Malay, the Malay community um, at University of Malay in the late 1960s, Malaysia transitioned by the starting in the late 1960s to a fully Malay higher education system, which helped to make higher education more accessible to Malay students, less to people from other communities who less often were well-educated in Malay language, but rather in English or in, in other vernacular languages. Um, and the university had previously been Anglophone, very British. Um, but also he helped to lead a move toward prioritizing Islam on campus and then also among the Malay community, and later once he entered government, which we'll get to shortly, um, within the wider society and polity. And so these things become really inseparable. The idea of Malay identity, of a Muslim identity, and also of really the language and culture of the Malays, which again, the constitution defines these things as of a piece, including a religious identity. As more and more Malaysians now, almost everyone, learns Malay language habitually, as Malay culture is now officially the, the defining culture and character of the Malay polity, Islam has become even more salient as really the one remaining sharp marker that says one is Malay and entitled to this special position, Kududukan Istimewa in Malay, or that one is not. And so in that initial post-colonial era, we see an Islamizing of what it means to be Malay, at least in, in, in a loose yeah. sense. It becomes a bit more defined. Now, what's interesting about uh, Anwar is, I think you mentioned this, he founded a, a group called the Malaysian Islamic Youth Movement, the ABIM, and he promotes this idea of, of Manhaj Malizi, which is, uh, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, a, a type of Malay uh, Islamic preaching, an Islam that is uh, harmonized with uh, Malaysia's culture. And what's interesting about him is that he's very much connected to transnational networks, uh, whether they are you know, Islamic or Islamist. Many of these groups are part of this transnational Muslim Brotherhood network. And nothing that quite nefarious, but there are some clear definitive aspects of their ideas and politics uh, in terms of terminology and key concepts. And he appropriates that. But then he's also you know, linked to non-Muslim Brotherhood scholars like Sayyid Naqib al Athas, who's a Malaysian of Yemeni origin. And then later in his life, you know, some of these networks become uh, quite important in terms of safeguarding himself as a, as a person. And he's also connected to people who are in what one might call a neoliberal or even neoconservative circles in the West. And so he's someone who's rooted in his own country, but also to these transnational networks that are kind of disparate, whether they're Islamist or, or neoliberal. And so that reflects his evolution over time, but we see the seeds of that in this era. And so, you know, you talked about his political career and his formal entry into politics begins in the early 1980s. Um, Mahathir Mohamad becomes prime minister of uh, Malaysia in 1981, and he rules uh, until 2003. So he has a a long period of rule, and this is relationship with Anwar is very much like a, a soap opera, and so it's a, it's a long relationship. But initially, it begins as a partnership, right? And I, I'd like you to uh, discuss how this partnership between Anwar, uh, the kind of Islamic student activist, and Mahathir, the wily political operative, how does that form in the early 1980s? What's the basis for all of that? Yeah, so a lot of this really gets back to what you mentioned before, which is this period of Isl this Islamic resurgence is a term that's usually used of Dawa activism or this, you know, call to not just proselytize among others, but also a call to deepen one's own Islamic faith. Um, and so that becomes especially dominant in Malaysia really by around the early to mid 1970s. And a, a key player in this is Abim, this Malaysian Islamic youth movement which Amar helped to, to launch after he graduated from University of Malaya, 
as an organization to which graduates like himself could go to continue their campus thought law activism. In other words, to say this isn't just something that you undergo as a phase, you know, as a college student looking for community as an undergraduate, but that you can pursue throughout your life. And so Abim and other organizations, there's a whole, you know, whole slew of them that form with various, various different kind of political colors with different levels of um, immersion in the broader society or extraction from that broader society, sort of communes that form around particular visionary leaders and so forth. But Amar is really part and parcel of that. Mahathir, as he comes into power, this is by, by this point over a decade from those really pivotal 1969 post-election riots, a period of emergency rule of almost two years that followed the reorganization of the government, which initially was this basically consociational Malay Chinese Indian alliance of three parties. And instead it becomes this, you know, coalition, the Barisan Nacional with about a dozen parties. The membership shifted a little bit over time. It was very much a catch-all broad coalition, but increasingly dominated by UMNO. But Mahathir realized that one key dimension he needed to capture was Islam. And so part of his difference as he came into power, but something he couldn't do on his own, was this program of Islamization of state and society. And he brought Anwar in to spearhead that effort. That took on all sorts of forms, everything from launching what is now a major industry in Islamic finance to um, changing the role of Islam with or Islamist practice within the civil service. You know, so making sure that people actually go for Friday prayers, things like that, really stepping up over time, levels of observance and religiosity on campus with dress codes and things like that, and all sorts of other both subtle and unsubtle ways of ensuring that Islam has a really special and pronounced place within the polity. So Anwar is tasked with leading that effort as deputy, as as a, really Malaysia's, Malaysia's not just deputy prime minister, but Mahathir's heir apparent. Uh, they later have falling out, partly over Anwar's commitment to what you alluded to, neoliberalism, the Washington consensus, the time of the Asian financial crisis in the, the mid-1990s, and Mahathir's preference for much more maverick um, and kind of uh, economically nationalist policies. But up until that point, this really progressed in very um, defining ways under on Mars watch and with the participation of, you know, others in the government as well. But he, he's really seen as the iconic figurehead of that dramatic shift in Malaysia's political orientation. Right. And, you know, uh, he becomes a uh, finance minister in uh, and deputy prime minister in the early 1990s. And I'm wondering what happens in between, because we have someone who's initial political emergence is as a, an Islamist or Islamic activist. And he eventually embraces something akin to neoliberal economic policies. And so in the 1980s, we see rapid economic growth, especially in the late 1980s in Malaysia. So I'm wondering, to what extent is Anwar part of this growth story? And do we have a sense of how his own intellectual or his approach towards policy matures uh, under the stewardship of Mahathir? Yeah. Um, so I think part of it really with reflects that eclecticism, intellectual eclecticism, to which you referred earlier. So Anwar starts off a ch really a product of his time. So at the time that he's in university in the late 1960s, and then as he's continuing to support and even help to lead student protests and other youth protests as a recent graduate in the early 1970s, this really pivotal period in Malaysian political life, He's very much on the left, as were students broadly at the time, you know, not just in Malaysia. He once had told me that he was he was in Paris on the left bank, you know, in the, the little late 1960s protests there. And then later in the 70s, he was also in Iran after the revolution uh, with the, the deposing of the Shah there. Um, and so he's all over the map, quite literally, but also in terms of his ideas. And so I couldn't really pinpoint at what point he really shifts from this social justice-oriented general new left orientation that dominated campuses across Southeast Asia, um, including Malaysia in the late 60s and early 70s, and really was a phenomenon globally, especially among younger people um, who are really concerned with how to create a new vision and a new course of action for an increasingly post-colonial world. 
how he shifted and when he shifted so firmly to a neoliberal camp. But he was part of the apparatus under Mahathir that led that shift. So one very concrete way, for instance, was that um, he served that the pathway up to power in Malaysia has historically passed through the Ministry of Education as well as the Ministry of Finance as being really key roles to hold, which, of course, he held both of these as Minister of Education, even though he had been himself so pivotal a student leader and had benefited from the provisions on campuses then for students to explore ideas, to take activist stances, really to engage with society. They were actively encouraged until 1969 to take full full advantage of the opportunities they had to develop their capacities as future leaders of uh, Malaysia to be. And he did that more than perhaps anybody else. So Malaysia had very powerful student, a very, very powerful student union, the University of Malaya, up until uh, the, the early 1970s. There were these massive youth protests and specifically student protests and so forth. But once he was Minister of Education, his mindset by then had shifted. And I did have the opportunity once to ask him about this, to say, you know, look, as a student activist, you gloried in the space for intellectual exploration, for activism and so forth on campus. Now, then later as Minister of Education, he cracked down on the campus and started to state a division between pure knowledge and applied knowledge and to state that Malaysia in true neoliberal form should only be prioritizing the latter, human resource development, not ideological development. And, and his explanation was basically that that students had changed, youth had changed, that they were no longer so mature and capable and you know, leader material as back in his day. But I think the larger issue here is really that by that point, really by sometime in the mid to late 80s, and I really couldn't, again, pinpoint a specific date, and certainly by the mid-1990s, his philosophy of the state and of its role in the economy and his sense of where citizens fit into that model seems to have shifted such that we see a greater focus on mobilizing resources for economic development through a fairly state-led developmentalist model, which had swept Southeast Asia, you know, the, the tigers and dragons of Asia. This was the 1980s and 90s. This was up until the crash of the Asian financial crisis was very much the path Malaysia sought to take, which required strong leadership, ideally a less corrupt system than Malaysia unfortunately had had and still has uh, problems dealing with, um, but really the marshalling of resources, economic and human, uh, toward state-led development. And he was absolutely part of that under Mahathir's watch. And so that's the the Unwar 2.0. And, you know, it's I guess, and you said this, uh, uh, you know, it's hard to pinpoint whether he's someone who's a trendsetter or has a, a keen eye, a keen sense of where, where the political winds are blowing and, and follows those trends. And that may be the mark of, um, you know, a good politician in terms of that ambiguity. Now, wow. uh, in, the, in the late 1980s into the mid 1990s, Malaysia sees this exceptional uh, uh, economic growth, this rapid economic expansion. Uh, GDP growth hits, you know, somewhere around 10 percent uh, right up till uh, the 1997 Asian financial crisis. And so there is this boom and then there's this precipitous fall. And in 1998, the economy contracts by 7.4%. And so Malaysia is is just one of many Southeast Asian countries that are hit by this this financial crisis. And this is a a crisis that is not just uh, economic, but it's also social and political. And there are a lot of changes that are happening. There's this breakup between uh, Anwar and Mahathir. And then there's a new type of politics that emerges uh, Anwar proposes uh, an idea called uh, Masrakat Madani, and then he also leads a, a, a reform movement called Reformasi. So I'd like you to unpack these different uh, developments that are taking place in in Malaysia at the time, because uh, as I'd said earlier, it's unclear whether Anwar is pushing uh, these changes or being pulled by them, because there's also a very dynamic civil society movement that's emerging. So what are the, the driving forces of all this? Yeah, so Malaysia was, as you know, part of the general economic wreckage of the Asian financial crisis. But that crisis also had tremendous political repercussions across the region. So you saw most dramatically in Indonesia, the fall of Suharto, 
Uh, in Thailand, you have a period of political transformation uh, in South Korea and in so many countries that were hit by the crisis, you see really strong political repercussions. And Malaysia was not spared, though the government ultimately did not, did not change. So Anwar is ousted from his positions in the government in 1998. He's charged with sodomy and these trumped up legal cases um, and also with corruption and allegedly trying to cover up that sodomy. It wasn't, that was the first of two times he's charged with sodomy. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the usual explanation of why that specific charge is that this is something that would um, discredit him among his Islamist base. They wouldn't be able to climb back from that. You know, even mere adultery would be, all right, not good, but more common. Um, but at any rate, Mahathir really um, he makes a very public show of disowning Anwar. He goes on television and mimes, you know, what he sees as a mime for sodomy. Uh, you know, his parents were complaining, we can't have our children watching TV, all of this. So really, it's a very dramatic split. And Anwar launches this new movement in the immediate wake of that. So um, amongst all this, he's detained, he's beaten up in prison by the inspector general of police as it comes out. Um, so he's in and out. But while he is out, he is on the ground mobilizing. And when he's in, he's having his wife, Juan Aziza Juan Ismail, really take the lead for him. Uh, one of his daughters, who is then still a teenager, ends up also being part of this scene. That is Nur Isa Anwar, who's now really his, his right-hand person um, as, he's some cover- as he's prime minister. But he takes this moment to call for a reform of what he sees as a corrupt and really rotten system in Malaysian politics. And so he calls for reformasi. The other um, buzzword of all of this is Ka'adilan, justice. That becomes the core word in the name of his party. This is called Party Ka'adilan Nacional and then Party Ka'adilan Rakyat when they merged with a smaller party. Um, People's Justice Party or initially the National Justice Party. Um, and that justice is, as posters at the time declared, not just justice for Malaysia broadly, but justice for Anwar, showing a picture of him with this glaring black eye. Um, and so in terms of this question of whether he's following or leading or being pulled, I don't think we can really separate those forces, but it's it's an interesting question. So one of the things that Anwar had done exceptionally well particularly as finance minister through the 1990s, was assert an Asian intellectual leadership, especially with a book he published called The Asian Renaissance, looking at Asian leaders, but also really build close ties with the West. And for somebody who got his start as specifically an Islamist leader, this is actually something fairly new. You don't see a lot of this. Um, So Paul Wolfowitz is a close friend, and he mentions that a lot, even when people in Malaysia are not so crazy about that link. Um, but that then gives him something of a cushion. I don't think he intended it that way, but when he is ousted from the government and lambasted, particularly most proximately, apart from the sodomy charges, specifically for preferring a different economic path for Malaysia as a way out of the crisis than Mahathir um, did, that then gives him a, a premise for support in the West. And so part of what makes it so difficult to see whether he's being pulled or pushed or following or leading is that he's playing to different audiences simultaneously. So once he's out of out of prison, for instance, he is able to seek essentially exile um, at, at Georgetown and Johns Hopkins for, for several years um, as he's in the political wilderness before he comes back to Malaysia and really tries to restart a political career. Um, but he's always had that that tension among playing to a basically ethno-nationalist Malay base that is going to be motivated more, I mean, by all sorts of factors, but in terms of a, a really driving political ambition or interest, those of affirmative action policies, for instance, of giving what are really wide-ranging economic privileges and advantages to Malays, not just in access to education and things like that, which are very broad-based in their impact, but also to initial offerings of shares when public when companies go uh, for public listing or of condos and new developments of all sorts of government contracts and so forth. So a lot of those things help those who come to be termed somewhat uh, dismissively the, the Umno Putra instead of the Bumi Putra. So the Bumi Putra are the sons of the soil, the indigenous people, Malays and other groups. The Umno Putra are those who are the sons of Umno, Anwar's 
erstwhile party, uh, the United Valley's National Organization. So he has that group to which he's playing and by which he is supported. He also has still an Islamist base, still deep loyalty, which remains with him in Abim. But in the meantime, as the Statwa movement, this Islamic revival has proceeded, Malaysia's Islamist, political Islamist scene has has grown and diversified. And so there are all these different strands as Saudi Arabia, for instance, comes in you know, a bit later and starts funding schools and so forth, that we find different Islamist bases. So at the time of his ouster, Anwar is still a player because Abiyam is still a fairly substantial group um, in that scene. Over time, that starts to, to wobble a bit. Not his basis within this sector of sort of Ikhwan or brotherhood linked Islamist groups, but just where that fits within the broader Islamist landscape in Malaysia. And then he also has this sort of progressive, not wholly secular, but more secularist base to which he's also playing with things like the the Asian Renaissance book. Um, This is the group that shows that he is, you know, the Muslim leader who can talk to the West, who can represent Malaysia as being progressive, as being, you know, um, really upwardly mobile as a country, as being outwardly oriented as a society. And so he has these different hats that he wears. And I don't think it's necessarily cynical. I think for the most part, this is a sincere, um, almost polyglot personality in terms of all the different things that he sees as featuring in his message and his persona and the basis to which he plays. But that's part of what helps to cement this Reformasi movement, which at the time that it forms in the late 1990s, brings together factions that had never previously been able to cooperate. So in particular, this Chinese-based, not exclusively Chinese, but Chinese-based Democratic Action Party, or DAP, and the party Islam Malaysia, PAS. Initially, there was a lot of speculation that Amr might join the Pan-Malaysian Islamic Party, PAS. He didn't. Instead, he and his wife uh, started this new party, which emerged out of a social movement. So as you note, a lot of this is driven by years of activity among civil society organizations, which themselves tended to be divided among Islamist groups and catch-all inclusive groups, many of them, you know, urban NGOs and the like. But all of these organizations come together, help to bring party-based activists in the perennial opposition with whom they're linked together as well. And you have what eventually becomes the Barisan Alternative, the alternative front that runs against the Barisan National, the National Front in 1999. And so uh, Anwar 2.0 is this insider, this uh, consummate political insider. Now there's an Anwar 3.0 who takes the form of a, a political dissident. And yes. And so as the Islamic political scene in Malaysia diversifies it and the, the role of civil society grows, uh, so too does Anwar's political base and, and the groups to which he's trying to appeal. And part of that appeal is this uh, idea of Madani, right? And this Masarakat Madani model, you know, there are multiple uh, iterations of it. But what, what does it stand for in this initial articulation by Anwar in the, in the late 1990s? Right. So this is something he actually first initiates as a model while he's still in in UMNO, in the government, um, to propose this idea of Masharakat Madani as an, he initially frames it really as an alternative framing of civil society. That it is what in Singapore at the time is being called a civic society, but a non-confrontational, more consultative, deliberative, constructive social mass that really helps a society to prosper and, and and grow. Um, and he bases this on an idea of sort of Islamist justice, of the social compact that dominates in um, in basically ancient Islam or the early years of Islam, and as something that can fit within Malaysia. And so for him, this is another way of thinking of civil society that seems less tied to Western democracy, liberal democracy, and more tied with the distinctiveness of Malaysian society. And We'll get to this later, but now as prime minister, he's revived this concept of Madani, but with um, more of of a governing edge rather than really focusing on it as something about civil society. Right. And so this uh, initial conceptualization of Madani is it harmonizes uh, Islamic thought with classical liberalism in many ways. And it elevates the maqasid al-sharia or the, the principles of Islamic law, uh, which are these kind of legal concepts uh, that were uh, part of the classical Islamic tradition. 
and kind of reemphasized by more contemporary thinkers affiliated with some of these transnational Islamic uh, intellectual networks like the uh, International Islamic Institute and and Yusuf al Qaradawi and others, and the idea is that these uh, conce- these uh, Islamic law or the objectives, the maqasid or objectives of uh, Islamic law, are essentially to protect uh, life, property, health, religion, lineage, and honor. And so, it's more of the conceptualization of the purpose of the state and uh, is for protecting fundamental rights as opposed to being mainly a, a coercive entity, you know, uh, an entity that uh, seeks uh, the hegemony of over violence and thought and belief. And so this is kind of the opposite of that. And it, uh, at least in its initial form, uh, there are a lot of similarities between Madani 1.0 and, and classical liberalism. And I think Anwar Ibrahim, when he speaks to Western audiences, especially during his period of exile, directly makes that case. Now, in in the uh, late 1990s and early 2000s, uh, he's either in prison or out of the country. And uh, as you had mentioned earlier, his wife, Juan Aziza, plays a a very important role, and she rises to the role of a a national political figure. So I'd like you to talk about the role she plays, because, you know, this is very much uh, important to the, the Anwar story. And she plays quite a heroic role and emerges as a, a very important politician on her own. So how does that transition take place? Well, it's, it, ends, it, it really takes place pretty quickly and fairly organically. So one of these initially presents herself as being a stand-in for her husband, like very explicitly as the loyal wife who is seat warming for him. At the same time, that, that role of seat warmer evolves into a political career of her own. So they end up both in government, along with then their daughter, Neuroisa, as well, one of their daughters. Um, but she initially is really not a born politician and also has additional pressures to face as a Malay woman in politics. So I, I remember, for instance, in some of the early days of her campaigning, uh, like 1999, her getting pushed back for, you know, what she's wearing traditional Malay clothing. She has a, a headscarf in her, and her head is, she's veiled and Malay, the term is a tudung. Um, but at the same time, she's covered less thoroughly than some in POS would prefer. You know, this Malaysian Islamic party, which is a coalition partner. So she's under some pressure really to conform to their preferences for what performance of religious devotion they deem as appropriate for a Malay Muslim female leader. Um, so she does not really articulate policy positions or or stances of her own. That, I mean, honestly, really hasn't through her political career. But mostly, especially in those early years, she really did present herself, again, quite explicitly, as standing in for her husband, as standing for justice, as being the linchpin of the party. Um, and so in some ways, you know, one might critique that stance as being not necessarily the most helpful for really trying to develop a party on a dynamic basis as having really a lot, you know, principles and policies that it stands for beyond the fairly amorphous idea of Adilan or justice and Anwar as a person. And that, I think, that initial origin, I think, has continued to plague this, the party to make it still very personalistic very factionalized, um, often seeming to be working against its own interests as these factions go to war. You know, a large proportion of the party splintered off in, in 2021 as you know, the government collapsed and, and so forth. Um, but yeah, so she plays a very important role. Um, and I would just say it's worth mentioning that Malaysia still has, comparatively in global terms, a very low proportion of women in parliament or in other high public office. And so for Juan Aziza to be in such a leading position, heading a party, being in government, being, you know, in the cabinet, that itself is is just genuinely independently important in representational terms in Malaysia. And then all the more so when, again, their, their daughter, Norisa, also comes to play a role and is seen as having a somewhat more independent identity and more of a policy agenda than her mother. Um, and so that itself, yes, being Anwar's daughter, this is a, a region of strong dynastic politics. That definitely helps Daryl Isa. But at the same time, she really develops a persona and a platform as a politician in her own right. 
Right. And and that leads me to my next question, which was going to be about the dynastic politics in the broader region. You know, we see this in Indonesia, which is going to have its elections uh, later this month. And and Joko Widodo, who uh, emerged as an anti-establishment or new political force, has taken on the characteristics of more established uh, polit- politicians in Indonesia, attempting to establish his own political dynasty. So, you know, Anwar has, for so much of his political career, he stood up against uh, corruption and cronyism. And so I'm wondering, uh, the involvement of his his family members in politics was by necessity, but there is also, as you noted, this a dynastic element. And so how similar is it to what we see in other countries in the region like Indonesia? Uh, there's no, there are no allegations of, of corruption or anything like that. This is more so about power politics or what's going on here? It's been a mix. So there have been, you know, any number of reports and allegations that came out about Anwar and his days in Barisan Nasional and Amno. Uh, indeed, one of the things that helped to bring him down or rather to signal that he was about to be knocked down. Uh, was this book that was circulated among participants in an UMNO General Assembly, if I remember correctly, called 50 Reasons Why Anwar is Unfit to be Prime Minister or something like that. Uh, it was Lima Pulidalil, Reasons. And, you know, it, it had all these allegations. I mean, none of this is approved. It's speculation or kappa on the end, the sort of news of the wind rumor. But um, but all these allegations about Anwar. But, I mean, he was. He was an UMNO politician and in a party that is based on, by this point, really strong links between business and government, huge party holdings that start uh, with Amno's first purchase of a newspaper, Malay, major Malay newspaper, which is on Malayu in 1961. Party needed money. They developed an industrial base, essentially a portfolio. Malaysian politicians uh, serve on government like corporations. This now is no longer just a feature of the Barisan Nasional, but you know, across parties in Malaysia. And so it would be, it would be naive to assume uh, that Anwar as, you know, finance minister even, is above this system, that he held himself separate. There aren't and weren't allegations that he was, you know, exceptionally corrupt. There's a level to which there's a norm of politicians who increasingly buy, not in the early days of Malaysian independence, but within a decade or two, enter politics knowing that this is a good path towards wealth. That may not be their primary motivation, but it does happen. Um, it's only much more recently under the under Anwar's administration, though his party hasn't done a fantastic job really of enforcing this, that there's been more of a push toward um, asset um, declarations, for instance. But, you know, there are so many corruption trials and so forth over the years. And yet we also see these patterns of what is simply endemic, really taken for granted levels of self-enrichment. Um, you say that much the same applies to Mahatma himself. Never have I heard him as being, you know, tarred with being exceptionally corrupt. And yet, you know, his family has done really well. And his sons are now being investigated for tax fraud and so forth. You know, so, you know, there, there are some, there are issues. In terms of whether this is different from the rest of the region and all the Anwar's family dynamics, the dynastic politics there are different from those of other politicians in Malaysia. I think we need to situate him within a larger frame, which is to say, yeah, initially there is this issue of his wife's standing it. And and that can happen. This is the um the much touted fortunate widows and wives and you know daughters phenomenon of you know Corey Aquino standing in for her husband and so forth. But these politicians develop a political identity and agenda of their own. Um and it would be a complete myth, however commonly stated, to assume this is something that only benefits women. Rather, you see men also standing in or gaining gaining leverage from the fact of their family ties as well. This is just the way much of political leadership develops in Southeast Asia, and not just in Southeast Asia, but we'll focus on that. So if we think across Malaysian parties, we have, uh, you know, the DAP, in which, you know, Lim Kit Siang passes the the gavel on to his son, who becomes chief minister of Penang, uh, then later uh, finance minister, you know, leading political figure, largely on the basis of who his father is. Uh, we have uh, in Amna, we have Mahathir, whose son, one of them, was a chief minister, a uh, mentor Basar of, of, you know, a state and who's not being investigated. But the, again, passing passing the torch onto the next generation. In Indonesia, we find the same thing. In the Philippines, we find the same thing. And it does seem that these patterns are developing more and more across the region. 
we have different di- <clears throat> dynamics country by country. So in the Philippines, a lot of this really has to do with clan-based economic holdings. There's less of that in Malaysia. It's more that having a position within the party is something that's worth passing on to to your progeny. And so we, we, I could continue naming politicians whose generally their children have succeeded them. There are so many. You know, Najib Razak, the massively corrupt former prime minister who was really behind the whole 1MDB horrible money laundering and corruption saga. It's the son of a former prime minister, Tun Raza. Um, and so we find this sort of pattern across uh, families. So yes, for Anwar, there's a specific reason why it starts. But at the same time, that level of nepotism, um, because that is really in part what it is, even when these people are well qualified, that really is a function of the system. The one time that this became really problematic for Anwar was shortly after he became prime minister after the most recent elections in 2022. His daughter, Neural Isa, did not win her seat, which was the family seat that had been passed through members of the family in Penang State. But he named her an unpaid but special advisor. And that immediately prompted calls of nepotism and really uh, the, the term nepo baby or nepo baby uh, started circulating in Malaysia. I had not encountered it previously. Now I know it well. But she was forced to step back from that position. She remains a very important advisor to him, but not in an official capacity. Right. Yeah. And, and no one likes <laughs> nepo babies, <laughs> even here in the U.S. Now, uh, I want to fast forward to yeah. 2022. And there's a lot that happens in between, you know, this initial persecution at the hands of Mahathir and his final uh, ascent to the office of the prime minister in 2022. But it's ahead of the elections. Uh, he proposes what one might call Madani 2.0. So we had discussed Madani 1.0, and Madani 2.0 uh, is uh, markedly more secular in tone. Uh, the references to Islam are, you know, one might say marginal, and is you know very much embraces a, a pluralist form of, of politics. So, what is behind this transition? Because it also coincides with the demands of coalition politics in Malaysia. It's a very fragmented political system, and there are a lot of changes that are happening, uh, much like the Asian financial crisis triggered uh, kind of a disruption to to the political order. So did the 1MDB uh, scandal. And so at this moment, there's an opportunity, but he has to assemble, uh, you know, this new cast of characters to form a coalition government. And so there's an idea behind this, uh, this Madani 2.0 is, you know, what I'm calling it. And so aligns with the type of political base uh, he needs to form or the political coalition he needs to form. So uh, I'd like you to explain how uh, this newer version of Madani is different from the previous one and how it aligns with his political interests. Yeah, it's such an interesting development because he takes the term Madani with which he's so much associated from, again, back in the Darsan National days, not from after that point. Um, and he turns it into the premise for the current, you know, economic and political framework. Oddly, this time around, Madani is a really twisted and tortured Malay acronym for an English term. So the initial English framework that he puts out is script, sustainability, compassion, respect, innovation, prosperity, and trust. And so he has to switch the order of terms and then also pick you know, not the first letter of the term. So for instance, it starts with Madani is Kamampanan. It's the M in Kamampanan, a term that starts with K for sustainability that becomes, you know, the acronym. And so it really suggests that there's a very, like an actually different starting point here, which is an English acronym, English language acronym for the type of government he wants to set up and specifically the type of economic model. So he establishes one of the first really concrete things his government does is to promulgate this Madani economic framework which is really a way of trying to pull Malaysia out of what's seen as a middle income trap, a tra- trap as uh, finding a way to promote uh, sustainable development, to bring groups who haven't been prospering more fully into Malaysian economic growth, whether these be women or those from you know, marginalized regions or sectors, um, ways to retool um, Malaysia's reliance on different parts of, of uh, you know, the resource base and so forth. It's a fairly sweeping economic agenda it's been criticized for lacking some more concrete deliverables, but it's it's ambitious, right? 
Um, and that becomes the premise. And now you're hearing more and more of Madani this and Madani that as the Madani government um, instead of the unity government, which initially was called, for lack of a better term. Um, it is a very odd coalition, which brings together what has been Anwar's coalition since his fall from the Barisan National. It's gone through different names. It's currently called Pakatan Harapan. No longer includes PAS, but includes um, a smaller party called Amr now, which is an offshoot from PAS, which actually, since you mentioned before, Makassi Sharia, some of the people who have been involved with um, Amr now have also been involved with that, you know, sort of promulgating that specific approach to political Islam in Malaysia. It brings together Pakatan Harapan with the Barisan Nasional, with these incredible rivals to Anwar over all these years. So this is an odd twist in Malaysia's never boring politics. But Something that can bring them all together is, you know, this sort of amorphous, inclusive Madami agenda. At the same time, by reverting to this term, and I, I, I'm, I'm assuming this, but by reverting to this term, Anwar subtly but importantly reasserts his Islamist premises, his basis in, you know, a, an early vision of political Islam in Malaysia, of a Malay cultural movement that sought really to promote not just overarching development, but also really to support the Malay community and Islam in Malaysia. This is, of course, important because Mah- because Anwar's leading opposition now is Perikatan Nasional, is this coalition. It, there's one small other party, but it's mostly PAS, the Islamic Party, and Bursatu, which is the latest offshoot from uh, UMNO. It previously was part of Pakatan. It broke off in 2021. It's now there. And so this is an almost exclusively Malay and specifically far more Islamist coalition. So people talk in alarmist terms about a green wave in Malaysia. One can explain Prikatan's uh, success just as easily and perhaps better in terms of economic demands, anti-corruption efforts, and so forth. Um, but using the term Madani sort of reminds, I think, people of the fact that this was on Mars base. Um, he's now also tried to assert that in unsubtle ways, such as his support for not just Palestinians broadly um, and the humanitarian crisis in Gaza, but also specifically for Hamas as you know a long-term party and movement that Malaysia has supported. Um, and Malaysia has no diplomatic relations with Israel. Its its loyalties were not at all in question uh, when the current crisis broke out, but Amar has really taken a, a sharp stance. The one thing that further complicates this big picture, though, gets back to your last question, which has to do with corruption. And that is Part of the reason that Barisan National and specifically UMNO fared so poorly, its worst performance by far ever in the last election, allowing Anwar's coalition finally to come to power with him at the helm instead of somebody else, is corruption. That Zahid Hamidi was wildly unpopular, uh, was un- in the midst of corruption trials for his role, largely in the one MDB saga. Others were also facing trials, are called the court cluster within UMNO. And Zahid is now Anwar's deputy prime minister. And indeed, his charges have been, dis- it's, a, it's a DNA, DNAA, a discharge not amounting to acquittal. The Malaysian Anti-Corruption Commission, Attorney General, they can still continue their research and levy these charges again. But for now, he's off the hook on 47 charges for which he was in the midst of trial. And then more recently, just you know days ago, Najib, the incredibly discredited um, prime minister, former prime minister under UMNO, who really led to Amno's fall through his role in um, the a massive corruption of 1MDB, has now also had a partial pardon under Anwar's watch. This is at the behest of the Pardons Board, which for the federal territories, including Kuala Lumpur, is headed by the, the king, uh, who's one of the Malaysian sultans of nine states that have them. So his last act as outgoing king because this rotates every five years, was to cut Najib's sentence uh, and his fine quite dramatically. So all of this, especially the leniency towards Najib and Zahid, really has undercut belief in, in, among the public in Anwar's commitment to countering corruption, even though that has, from the very outset, been really a guiding premise of his party and his coalition. So, you know, after being in power for, for well over a year, he's faced multiple tests of his idealism, this type of idealist politics that he's espoused uh, since the, the late 1990s. And I guess we're getting a sense of whether he's really living up to the hype. Now, more broadly, 
you know, he's been in power for a bit over a year. Uh, what's the kind of the consensus view on how he's fared, uh, not just in terms of corruption, but in terms of pushing for general reforms and economic growth? Has uh, has uh, Anwar as prime minister lived up to you know his reputation that he, he built up in the 1990s as uh, deputy prime minister and, and finance minister? How has he fared? Of course, opinions are mixed, but I think there's a lot of frustration with the very, very slow pace of reform and how little has been accomplished. Some of this relates to the nature of the coalition. As I mentioned, this is a cobbled together coalition of convenience of how to get to enough seats to govern while including not just ethno nationalist Malay parties, essentially. So this coalition includes the BN, specifically UMNO, it includes Pakistan Harapan, and then it includes state based coalitions from Sabah and Sarawak. Um, and as such, one might think it would be hard to come up with common ground. But actually, the platforms, the manifestos that each of these coalitions or parties put forth for the last election do have a lot in common. There has been no effort yet, though, there was a, to identify what that common ground is. Anwar, not long after the election and the formation of the government, said he would be launching a committee that would study the manifestos and the party's different stances and come up with a common agenda. Quite a long time after that, more than a year later, that has yet to happen. So instead, we have a coalition agreement that doesn't include policy goals. And that makes it hard to see to what the public is supposed to hold this government accountable when it comes to the next election um, and what they might expect. At the same time, there are these statements periodically by individuals within the administration or by Anwar himself about what they hope to achieve and a lack of progress on some of these, along with what's seen as really a crackdown on some civil liberties, investigation of filmmakers, for instance, um, or most recently, you know, calling in a former legislator, Tony Pua, for statements critiquing this um, leniency towards Najib, even though that is a widely shared opinion, except among some of the unknown loyalists who have come around to seeing him as now a hero again. Um, and so overall, I would say, including within our own government, there's a fair amount of frustration. Some of, some of that frustration recognizes the difficulty of governing and of achieving any really substantial institutional or legal reform with so cobbled together an administration. But some of it still sees that there could be more done. Um, and there are individuals within Amar's government who continue to press for reform on different dimensions for things like campaign finance legislation, political finance legislation, which Malaysia really desperately needs, or for at least subtle, if not more far reaching reforms of the electoral system, constituency delineation, and so forth, or for reforms to civil liberties, to transparency, and, and other things that would really help Malaysia's civil society to feel more confident moving forward. But it's not clear what of that will actually come to pass, if anything. In some ways, this may be just an impossible game for Anwar or any politician or party to win. But at the same time, there is a fair amount of frustration at large over the slow pace of what seems to be happening or at least attempted. Mm. And a uh, final question, you know, Anwar is uh, 76 years old. He may be at the, the tail end of his political career. And I say may because uh, his frenemy or enemy or whatever the state of the relationship is now, Mahathir Muhammad, uh, ruled in his in his 90s. And so, you know, he's maybe every uh, manifest, every politician's dream, <laughs> ruling yes. uh, literally forever and, and having a very long life. But I, I assume, you know, Unwar may have at, at most <laughs> 20 years left. Uh, and so um, I'm wondering at this stage in his, his political life, what do you foresee for this kind of last period of his political career? What do you think he may achieve and, and how much longevity does he have in terms of his relevance to, to the, the contemporary scene, political scene in, in Malaysia? And more broadly, what do you think his legacy will be? Right. Well, I think there's increasingly widespread sentiment that he at present at the present pace will likely be a one term prime minister just because the um, the coalition opposing him, Brigata Nacional, is gaining support. And he hasn't really been seen to do a lot that differentiates his coalition, his now unity government, Madani administration, to say this is why you should support us over this other coalition uh, in an increasingly majority Malay electorate that may be OK when push comes to shove with 
both just a change in general and with a more heavily Malay um, administration. So that itself is, raises questions for Omar's political future. He's done very little in terms of preparing for political succession. In fact, this is one of the grouses one hears against him is that he doesn't really trust others around him. He's pushing back challenges. It's, again, a fairly personalized, factionalized party still. Um, and that he is wary of advancing those who might come to rival him for leadership, even though he is, again, mid-70s. So that itself is also a problem. Um, and makes it hard to say what his political future will be in as much as his goal seems not to do a Singapore-style transition of stepping down munificently and handing the reins to your your chosen next successor, but may at times be your own son uh, if you're in Singapore. At any rate, so there's that question. But in terms of his political legacy, I do think that that will be indelible, which is he really has helped to make possible political change in a system that was so rigidified under the Barisan Nacional, this increasingly corrupt, increasingly problematic, increasingly really twisted version of what it started out as being, you know, with so little ideo- ideological premise, so much more that was really quite self-serving among the politicians involved, some of whom were, you know, really well-meaning and public service oriented, but many of whom were not. Um, and so it's really his fall and the way in which he rose again that helped to make political change seem feasible, and then to come to fruition. He didn't do this alone, however much that message may seem to resonate. Um, but I do think that his role in making that possible is simply is simply fact. Right. And, and the many political lives of Anwar Ibrahim is a, is a fascinating story. So thank you for telling us that. And that was Meredith Weiss. Please subscribe to our show on your platform of choice. And thank you for tuning in.